my talk will be divided in basically three three parts. The first part, I try to argue that there is a region in the insect brain that Barbara Webb introduced, which is the central complex, and that it be a deep homology to the basal ganglia. Then I will provide you with, for some of you maybe a little bit tedious, uh, data to give you more insights in how this uh, is, is uh, further progressing. And then in the third and last part of my talk, I will try to throw a few ideas at you where we are going and I would like to use or interact with you to see whether this is reasonable or not. The evolutionary implications of our findings I have kept out but I'm happy to discuss that afterwards. So selection and maintenance of behavioral activity, I mean this uh, image captures it. It's of uh, absolute and essential significance. If you are not able to select the appropriate behavior, you're dead and you will not reproduce. So it's very, very important. And we are interested in how these mechanisms uh, evolved, how they work, and uh, what is their significance. This is, I guess, for you uh, a very simple scheme, but for my clinical colleagues, keep in mind I'm surrounded by psychiatrists and neurologists. This is a fundamental image. You have, of course, internal representations, but also external input that needs to be integrated in order to have or to generate adaptive behavior. And action selection, I would like to uh, phrase it as a computational challenge. It has to coordinate motor actions and their organization into action sequences uh, by facilitating appropriate motor programs while inhibiting competing ones. This is best illustrated if you look at uh, cases where things go wrong. And here I illustrate some of the disease conditions that more or less show failures in action selection for various reasons. The one which you may think is the most far away is motor neuron disease. This is Stephen Hawking, but he's a very unusual example of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which usually, uh, when you lose your innovation of lower muscles, but there is recent evidence which points to a very prominent role uh, in the striatum of the basal ganglia. This kinesia, people uh, engage into, I would call it, meaningless actions, which are not well coordinated, and other examples we will see on the road. So, central brain regions involved in action selection are the basic ganglia, which are highlighted here, and in arthropods, these are is the central complex. So this is a picture by uh, Martin Heisenberg, which Barbara showed yesterday. Again, so this is the insect brain, the compound eye. Here's the brain. This is the uh, optic lobes, and here in in ochre is the central complex. The data that pointed towards the role in action selection go way back to uh, Martin Heisenberg's work, uh, but we also have now a rich data set in, in mammals that consolidate or argue that those two brain regions are involved in action selection. I will go into that in more detail. The first thing, when, when Nick Strasfeld and I bumped into each other at the conference at Janelia Farm, uh, we realized that we share common interests and we decided we should actually do something together. And we started to look at those two brain regions and thought there might be an ancestral ground pattern organization and we tried to <coughs> look into this. And what we did was we applied um, uh, a conceptual framework that was developed by somebody called Gaylord Simpson. He was a paleontologist in the 60s, last century, and then further developed by Butler and Hollis. I will come to that in the discussion probably. What we first did, we looked at uh, the embryology and topography of the central complex and the basal ganglia. And what you see here is a cross-section of an embryonic Drosophila brain it's a monolayered epithelium and all these little balls are actually the 108 identified stem cells that give rise to the fly brain. Mm -hmm. So we know them and we can actually give them names and locations like their postcode. They give rise then, you see that in the color coding, to the different regions in the adult brain. Similarly, we know that from Corbidian Brodmann, there is a map of the human brain, but we also know that they are of course derived from stem cells. So what they both share is there is a clonal origin for specific brain regions. 
The second thing we looked at was the development of genetics. And what you see here in the middle is, these are gene homologs. Most of them are transcription factors, some of them are growth factors. I'd like to point out two cases. So for example, this family here, these are homo domain transcription factors that can bind DNA and then activate transcription. These are the OT2, OTX and OTD cases. Initially, they are absolutely crucial for patterning of the anterior part of the brain. So for example, if you have a mutation in the OTX2 gene, your entire head is missing. Similarly, uh, actually we were the first ones to show that in Drosophila, if you lose this gene, your anterior part of the brain doesn't develop. This same group of genes is later then used to specify the stratum and the pallidum, which are parts of the basal ganglia, but also parts of the central complex. There is another interesting case here, just to mention, we have micropalatal projections that become later more important. There is uh, a gene called autism 2 that has been found by my colleagues at the Institute of Psychiatry, which uh, segregates with autism cases. It's Drosophila homologous type rich and similar to the human condition that is involved in ethanol induced reward, etc. We have also a corresponding modular arrangement and function of the, now we're looking at the striatum and the fan shaped body, where you have functional convergence of representation of sensory space. I will come to that. What Nick and I then came up with is a very simplified scheme. I would always say, almost say this is a Mickey Mouse scheme, which simplifies, oversimplifies things. So here on the left hand side, you see the mammalian brain, and here is the striatum the globus pallidus, which comes in an external and an internal segment, and then you have here the thalamus, this is the subthalamic nucleus, and this is the substantia nigra of prostopathia, which has dopaminergic input. On the right hand side, you have a schematized insect brain. Here you have the mushroom bodies, which are, if you like, the analogon or homologon to the hippocampus. The Central complex comes in the protocircle bridge, the fan shaped body, the ellipsoid body, and the lateral accessory hill. We also have dopamine expressing populations which have very specific innovations to the central complex, and I will pick that up later when I try to convince you that there is a Parkinsonian phenotype. This is a bit outdated because, due to recent data from Janelia Farm, there is now uh, evidence to argue, at least we did so in our 2015 paper, that indeed the fly may also have a subthalamic nucleus homolog, which is quite interesting in itself. So, what are these regions involved? So here again, uh, the nuclei, the stratum, the globus pallidus, sub subthalamic nucleus, substantia nigra, protosopal bridge, fan shaped body, lips and body, lateral accessory. Now these are behavioral manifestations where these brain regions and neuropils have been in, uh, in, in, uh, involved. And again, you see that there are some similarities, and I can assure you that some of my clinical colleagues have real problems to appreciate that, yes, these are homologous behaviors, right? We can discuss it later. What is the point here is that these are shared action selections, as I'd like to argue. We then came up with, uh, in a follow-up paper in 2015, with a comparison of the neural networks, and again, this is a simplification uh, for those of you who are familiar with basal ganglia, they will immediately argue where the archipolical ne neurons that have been recently found, where's the hyperdirect pathway. The purpose of this comparison is to identify similarities and to deduce predictions that can be analyzed. What is intriguing is that in both cases you have parallel projecting and partially segregated loops that integrate and convey sensory motor representations, which are involved in the selection and maintenance of creative activity. How is that done? Well, in vertebrates there is a rich uh, literature on this uh, and works over decades, and I want to illustrate it with some elegant work that has been carried out uh, a couple of years ago in the lab of Anatol Kreitzer, where they make use of optogenetics. For those of you who don't know that, optogenetics makes use of what is called channel reduction. You express it in a population of neurons, and upon a light pulse, 
you can activate neural activity. There is also the opposite to it, which is called halorotoxin. When you put a flashlight on it, you can inactivate neural activity. So you have kind of a remote control to trigger or abrogate neural activity. And what they did is they put to test the classical model of dopamine D1 receptor, direct pathway, and dopamine D2 receptor, indirect pathway activities in the striatum. Because a long hold model says it's a kind of a no go go uh, uh, concept. So, what they did is they expressed channel reduction in D1. And what you see here is when you see a gray dot, this means the mouse has been inactive. And then see when the laser is on in D1, they basically trigger locomotion, which was a strong argument that yes, indeed, the D1 pathway is a kind of a go pathway. That's an oversimplification, but for conceptualization it helps. This is the opposite situation. This is the indirect pathway, D2. Green is uh, laser on, and you can see that you basically abrogate locomotion. So yes, this picture looks like it is a go, no go, but it's not as easy as that. That is the work from Rui Costa's lab, who is now at the, I like the name, the Institute for the Unknown in Lisbon, <laughs> where he basically shows activity levels of direct pathway neurons and indirect pathway neurons when a mouse is executing a goal-directed uh, motion. And as you can clearly see, there is concurrent activity of both pathways. So the go-no-go, -no -go, or the mutual uh, uh, active-inactive uh, uh, concept does no longer hold, and I will pick that up later what that means. So, of course, the question then is, what are the underlying mechanisms? Because even though we have such a rich set of data now, and also with very sophisticated methods, it's still not really clear how this action selection uh, is carried out. And this is why I would like to point your attention out to this insect center complex here. Uh, and I would like to show you some data that are not published, but hopefully they will come up soon. <clears throat> First of all, a little bit of background again. So we are looking here at the adult Drosophila brain. This is the optic lobe. Here's the central brain. Again, these are the mushroom bodies, analogous to the hippocampus. And here is now the central complex, protocircle bridge, fan-shaped body, ellipsoid body, nodula, and the lateral accessory lobe. Thanks to several the effort of several labs, including the Rubin Lab, Lee Labs, Heisenberg Labs, Ito Labs, I usually forget one, sorry. Uh, clonal analysis shows that we have three architectural features. That is columns, as you can see in the color code. It's a column arrangement. You have a modular arrangement. This is a modular. And you have a layer arrangement, like this is not so clear here, but here you see the layers. Remember I talked about partially segregated loops and compartmentalization. What is important is that this kind of arrangement here is basically an, a, a representation of the sensory space, but it's not retinotopic, just to say that from the beginning. Uh, studies in several labs, including Janilia Farm, Roy Ritzman, uh, and others, showed, or Uwe Homberg, for example, here you see sensitivity to polarized light in the protocircle bridge. So this is used by the, by, by, this is computed by the central complex for integration. Here you see motor adjustment, spatial orientation memory, motor control, and visual place learning. So the very same region in the central brain is involved in a lot of similar things. Moreover, parts of the central complex, which is called the lateral accessory lobe, are kind of a pre-motor command center, where gating takes place to segmental motor circuits, central panic generators of the thoracic ganglia, which then either induce flight or walking. So again, we were interested to address this, and now I will focus on this region, the ellipsoid body. Why? Because we know when I just mentioned all those behaviors, and I should add 
There's a recent paper from Mark Muslap which shows it's even involved in sleep drive. Okay? So what is the common denominator of all this? Arguably, I say it's action selection. Or in the case of sleep drive, you could even argue it is the suppression of activity, because sleep means inactivity. The elixir body is this ring-like structure in the middle. It is very intriguing. It looks in insects like Drosophila like an actual ring. But please be aware this is a speciality for insects. It's a toroid-like, it's an arc in other arthropods. It comes in layers due to the fact that you can subdivide it into subtype specific ring neurons, R neurons, and you can see how they actually project into different layers of that ring. Part of our study, and this is really a shortcut, uh, is, uh, shows <coughs> that the entire set of ring neurons derives from one identified neural stem cell, which means that all those neurons here that build up the ellipsoid body are clonal. These are ontogenetic clones, which of course in terms of evolutionary uh, considerations is of great importance because it means that one stem cell can do it all. And of course you can think of what Stephen Gold uh, called acceptation. If you multiply that, you can generate several of those circuits. What is important, so here is uh, again these are confocal images. You see your adult brain, this is the ventral nerve cord corresponding to the spinal cord in our case. The argument here is that basically this neural stem cell gives rise to all subtypes of brain neurons. We then took, uh, made use of a genetic trick. In Drosophila you have a toolbox of uh, 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 genetic uh, manipulations available. One of them is you could, for example, genetically label postsynaptic compartments as well as presynaptic compartments and the type of GFP. And we, when, we, when we make use of what we call GAL4 lines that can be used to, uh, to transactivate a uh, reported gene like GFP or RFP, what you can see is that individual ring neurons, first of all, they project into the ring, so it's a layer specific projection. But also, when you look at the postsynaptic compartment, we were well aware of this region, which are called the lateral triangles. They also project into the ring itself, but also presynaptic connections. And that was quite intriguing, which actually made us wonder whether, actually I skipped this slide, whether they form connections. And here is a series of images. This is a super resolution microscopy for layer specific neurons. Here you can see what the point I would like to make is that pre and post synaptic labelings uh, above each other, like this, arguing for reciprocal connections. Here is some electron microscopy, but here is a super resolution video to illustrate this. So these are our two and four neurons where we now have in green labeled the presynaptic compartment and in red is the postsynaptic compartment. And the point is to show this uh, apposition of these two markers. There we go. So that, of course, is not an argument. These are actual synapses. We use what we call our uh, GFP reconstitution and postsynaptic partners. You have this marker gene GFP broken up into two parts. It's expressed in one neuron and the other part in the other neuron. And if they form in deep synaptic connections, the GFP is reconstituted. And we use two lines to do this. So this line here is R24 specific, expresses one part of GFP. This is R3 specific, expresses the other part of GFP, and this is the reconstitution. And what is intriguing is that those synaptic connections basically cover the entire modular and layered architecture, which is shown here. So keep in mind, you have synaptic connections that cover the entire sensory space. So we also know that these are GABAergic, and this is just a slide to illustrate this. Here you apply picotoxin, and this is a readout. So when you apply picotoxin, which is a competitive inhibitor of GABA receptor signaling, then you get an enhanced 
photo emission suggesting that you have relief inhibition. We can also do that genetically and then apply uh, electric stimuli and depending on the salience of the stimulus, you get a response. This is also true when you do it with electrodes, you implant electrodes into these neural cells and then depend, so here is picotoxin application, so it reproduces this, but then depending on the salience of the stimulus, you can induce spiking. And that is also true if you use uh, an environmental stimulus like temperature. So if you ramp up the temperature, and this is now uh, GCAM signaling, you realize that at a certain temperature they start to become activated, and at a certain critical temperature they start to spike. So, I showed you that these neurons derive from one single stem cell, they are lineage related. I showed you that they form reciprocal connections, and I showed you that they are GABAergic, which argues for a reciprocal inhibition circuitry here. And for those of you who um, do modeling, this is something which is familiar. Reciprocal inhibition is a widespread functional module in the CNS of a lot of animals, and it's often involved in, if you want to synchronize things, if you want to uh, uh, regulate, coordinate uh, rhythmic activity, such as behavior. So we then wondered what are these ring neurons doing in action selection, and the way it evolved in my lab, uh, we looked for the most basic selection, and of course this is again very simplified, we are now doing more sophisticated stuff, which is to act or not to act. Here, of course, this is a fight and flight, but also I, I captured this from, from, from uh, to not in this way, so to speak. So, and what we do is we make use of an open field paradigm. So the flies are in a little dish, they can run around, we do not click the wings, but they cannot fly away. Okay, so here are the little arenas, a lot of them, 36. What we have are little motors, so we can give them a shock and see how they respond to a stimulation. What you see here, each line is the, the behavior of one fly, and each black spot is a bout of activity, measured in frames per second, etc. And you can clearly see there are intermediate white spots, which means the animal paused. This is the trajectory of it, and as you can imagine, we can now deduce certain parameters with which you can define, at least from a conceptual point of view, actions and action sequences. So for example, activity. Activity over time and percentage, you can clearly see if you ramp up the heat, the flies don't like it. And we know they prefer a temperature around 25 degrees. If you go to 31, they try to escape. What we also see here is that they become faster. And what is very intriguing here, if you just look at this very simple experiment, Please note, while the activity is increased, the numbers of actions are reduced. So there's already clearly an algorithm to be seen. And that, of course, is because they pause less and maintain a board of activity for a longer time. We can also then induce a mechanical stimulus and, and measure how they respond to it. This is a typical readout. In this case, now you see at the top, the different layers, outer, middle, inner ring, and if we then inactivate, for example, the GABA-A receptor, you can clearly see that all of a sudden activity is disinhibited, right? However, uh, arousal state or this kind of stress or thresholds are not affected, as you can see in the stimulus response. Again, here are the measures, right, which tells us that these ring neurons uh, are involved in actions and their assembly to action sequences. And that means in the way a bout of activity, its duration, its onset, and its stop is coordinated. So, and that of course resembles similarities, at least at the conceptual level, to the direct and indirect pathway activities. Because this is exactly what those in the uh, basic ganglia do. We then went one step further and tried to conceptualize that with a, a, a computation model, and that's done in collaboration with Vincenzo Fiore and Ray Dolan at UCL. So here is a simplified architecture. This is the protosomal bridge, ellipsoid body, lateral accessory lobe, 
for ease, we skipped the fan shaped body. But the major point here is remember, I showed you reciprocal inhibition along these neurons. So, this is what, compared to other models, we integrated here based on our data. So, in contrast to a lot of you guys, what we do is we do we come with biology and then we ask people, okay, what does that mean? Can can you create a model that gives us predictions that we can then actually test in the fly? So this is the model here. You have some noisy stimuli representing the, uh, the eight modules here, eight on each hemisphere. And one of the first uh, uh, interesting predictions that came out was it's actually a very powerful. Uh, 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 architecture for selection and switching. So here is the ellipsoid body and as you can see here is activity restricted to one of the ellipsoid body modules and that then means it is translated to the lateral accessory lobe which is the premotor command center. Now when we developed this, this model uh, a paper was published by uh, Vivek Jarayman and uh, Janelia Farm where they used visual stimulation and then act, uh, measured the activity in the ellipsoid body ring. And as you can see, this activity is more or less restricted to one module. And that very much represents what our model predicts, right? However, I should note here, so for those uh, who are, please be aware this is not retinotopic. What they have found out is that actually this activity is correlated with the animal's orientation to the most salient cue. And that is critical. And I think there was yesterday uh, also someone talking about head orientation. And there's recent work from Rob Richmond's lab, which very, very nicely brings that home. So, but coming back to our model, what this armor and circuitry mediates actually is salience detection. Remember, we had several noisy uh, signals. <coughs> And this is done by a winner-take-all functionality, which I have to say that comes back to the very famous Redgrave, Gurney, and Fresco paper, which actually predicted that already, uh, leading to the selection of only one active module and batch, for which Vivek and, and Johannes actually provided this very nice evidence. And what is also the point is our model predicts that this enables the switching between activity states, which they very nicely show. This is also true when you have a very noisy signal, so when you ramp up to 31 degrees, selection is still possible. It's not that the animal collapses, it still has a meaningful adaptive response to it, but it's much faster than run around. Also, what our model predicts is maintenance. So depending on the strength of our neuron connections, the lateral inhibition can actually maintain a selected activity, even after input has changed. And this is again uh, very nicely shown by Vivek and Johannes. What they did is when they put a very salient stimulus, visual stimulus to the fly, and they switch it off, what they could observe is see the time scale here? Even after 88 seconds, the signal remained. And that can be explained by our model. We tested this model also for how robust it is. And I, I will flick through that, but I'm happy to show that to you later. It will be in, in the paper. So here the input, for example, to the protoserval bridge is increased by 100%. You can see that, how it ramps up here compared to here. But still, salience detection is working. Similar, if you have uh, within the ellipsoid body, the lateral inhibitions increased by 100%, it still works. The same is true when you look at from the ellipsoid body to the lateral accessory lobe, or vice versa, it works. And the same is true here when you have all aforementioned connections increased by 100%, it is very stable. So this is basically the summary of it and the essentials of this model based on the biology that we found, but also taking into <coughs> account data from other groups, is that this action selection circuitry can carry out three core functions, which is salience detection, switching, and activity maintenance. And just a note for those of you who are interested, activity maintenance, in a way, could be regarded also as a kind of short-term memory. So, 
As said, these army uncertainty activities exhibit similarities to direct and indirect pathway activities. This is uh, again very interesting. I refer to uh, Tony's and uh, Peter Redbrake's and uh, Gurney's paper. We know even before their paper by a conceptual model that goes back to Jonathan Mink. He's a neurologist who came up with this model where he conceptualized basic ganglia function as surround inhibition and focus facilitation, uh, which needs to be modified to some extent. But the point I want to make here is that action selection can be conceptualized as a computational algorithm that translates facilitation, inhibition, and disinhibition <coughs> into the selection of motor actions and the organization into action sequences. And I think similar things are happening in the central complex of insects and likely also arthropods. So what we may look at are evolutionary conserved mechanisms for action selection <coughs> and I argue also in health and disease. Now let me provide one example of why I think this is also applying to disease. What happens when things don't work? Uh, here are a number of dysfunctions that are associated with basic ganglia and the central complex. Motor abnormalities, we are all familiar with that, impaired memory formation, attention deficits, affective disorders, sleep disturbances. And here are a number of diseases that are actually studied at the Institute of Psychiatry from Parkinson's disease to schizophrenia, where you have either one or a mixture of those dysfunctions that are associated with basic ganglia dysfunction. Now, I want to show you one case. This is Parkinson's disease. For those of you familiar, here is the substantia nigra here. And you have a very specific loss of these uh, dopaminergic neurons, which then impasse the striatopalatal pathway. Right? And that is very, very crucial uh, because Parkinsonian patients are characterized through difficulties to initiate actions. And for those of you who have seen uh, potentially somebody at a traffic light, those people are, they have problems to initiate a movement. And some of them use a trick, so for example, they have a stick with a laser pointer, and when they put a line in front of them, it helps. So they have, they need a trigger, a salient stimulus to overcome that. So here is the argument in Drosophila, we have artificially induced Parkinsonism in the fly, so to speak. Here are the trajectories of control animals. This is a Parkinsonian fly. We did that by targeted impairment of mitochondrial function. The dopaminergic system in flies comes in clusters. These are names. So here, for example, protocerebral uh, 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 posterior middle <coughs> part of three. And I'll point that out because if you look at those guys here, here are the cells, this is a clonal analysis again. They very specifically project into the ring of the ellipsoid body and the lateral accessory lobe. So what you look at here is the DAEBLAL pathway. And again, if you remember our Mickey Mouse uh, uh, graph, this is a bit like the stratopalatal pathway. So this is what I try to argue, we have other examples, and now I would like to provide a few well, ideas that we are currently following up, and this is kind of a platform for discussion. Uh, so the first one is, of course we all know now that the basic ganglia is involved in sensory integration, and there have been recently papers which show that the striatum is involved in sensory integration, but it's an integration that is irrespective of the sensory modality, which is exactly what is happening in the central complex. So, I, I think this is for this audience uh, almost an insult if I showed it to you, but dimensionality reduction, if, if n is uh, larger than m, then the dimensions are reduced, but the point here is to make, keep in mind, in the striatum, which connects to the, to the internal part of the globus pallidus, which is the direct pathway, remember, of the genetic activation. The mouse is triggered into activity. You have a 1,000 to 1 reduction, which is enormous. And we are studying 
this kind of concept from a very unusual point of view. Maybe I should first discuss that. Uh, we, are, we are addressing this with a company called Hammerhead VR. Uh, Steve Jolly is the CEO there. And I recommend, if you have time, look their web page out, for example. They, they, they are uh, specialized in virtual reality. They, current, they recently did Andy Murray in, in virtual reality. Uh, look it up. What these guys did, and we came across it by, by serendipity, is they had to address the fact that if you want to have something in virtual reality, what you want is that it is real enough for you to immerse in it. So you put up your, your, your uh, goggles and you want to immerse in it. If you in initially use all the details available, you will immediately run into a problem because of you know, uh, memory space and, 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 and computational power. And what they did is to solve that is a very empirical solution. And what I would like you to do now is, this is by the way the CEO of GoPro, so look at this guy three times and a little experiment, of course if you would be immersed it would be more, but make up your mind which one of those looks realistic enough to be, yeah, well, so that you would talk to him, okay, you see? Which one would you guess? This one, this one, or this one? Middle? 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 Wow. Well, I should record that. <laughs> That's data free of charge. <laughs> Look at this. Do you see it? This is uh, an artist who had to reproduce the data they got. This is no science whatsoever, but they produce science. So somebody had to reproduce this information and you can immediately see the difference, right? The triangles that have been used to reproduce that. And the trick is this. You have 20,000 triangles for this one, 5,000 for this one, and 869 for that one. That's sufficient, right? And of course, the code is precious that they created. <laughs> The second example is coordinating units of behavior, actions, and action sequences. Again, this is at the very you know, hand-waving uh, level. Here you have an insect moving around. Here is, we have seen this. From a conceptual level, animal movement can be described as sequences of actions. They can be regarded as units that are either hierarchical and or serially organized in adaptive behavior. What do I mean with that? Rui Costa nicely put that forward. Here is an action sequence. And you could actually see, you could, activity can be, you know, for every action, for the boundary, for the start and stop, for sustained and inhibited. Remember what they showed is that you can initiate action or stop it. D1, D2. Here they are again, right? And it's exactly what they showed. It's their coordinated activity that is required for start, stop and maintenance but also inhibited. And remember I showed you this one, where you have concomitant activity of D1 and T2. And Rui and his group showed that this is required for the parsing and concatenation of action sequences. So you could hypothesize, and we discussed it briefly over a coffee, that, well, it is not go, no go, because they are together active. But as you can see here, right, there is a meshwork of those neurons. And the question of course is, or the hypothesis I would try to you know, throw out here is, that it is the specific combination of D1, D2 activity that may code for stop, stop, maintenance, or how you put things together in a sequence of activity. And that has to be put to the test. But it can be done now with optogenetics, and this is what we try to do in the fly, because we have similar D1 and D2 activity that in this case are very specific to the ellipsoid body, so we can address that. Mm -hmm. So again, we can address, if you like, this tritopalatal pathway in Drosophila and test whether a motor code, uh, a code for motor 
where the class of programs exists. The third one I'd like to, is a very brief, it's just a mention, it's a bit of an advertisement, because what we found in Drosophila, uh, such as principal inhibition and the computation model we developed, has been already applied to understand uh, the brain stimulation. Parkinsonian patients, when they become, uh, when it becomes very severe, often deep brain stimulation is the only thing that seems to help, and it stimulates the subthalamic sub nucleus, which is shown here. What we developed together with Ray Dolan and Vincenzo and others is uh, a model that specifically addresses the limitations of the, the rate model and how it handled the indirect pathway. I don't have time to go into that. I would point out this paper that uh, was just published uh, in Scientific Reports, Changing Pattern in the Basic Ganglia and Motor Switching and the Reduced Dopaminergic Drives, where we added with our model some novel functions that have uh, formerly not been captured by the rate model. And last but not least, uh, I mentioned at the beginning uh, Stephen Hawking and ALS. Uh, we are also working on that, uh, which is you know the two sides of the lab. One is how do you <coughs> assemble a neural network, and the second one is how it becomes dysfunctional. Very briefly, TDP43 is an RNA binding protein. Here are the RNA recognition motifs, nuclear localization sequ sequence, and here is what is called the uh, prime-like domain where a lot of mutations in patients of ALS and frontotemporal dementia have been found. This protein starts to aggregate in the cytoplasm and it's normally nuclear located and it becomes depleted in the nucleus. These accumulations are found in almost all cases of motor neuron disease and in nearly 50% of frontotemporal dementia. And remember, uh, when I showed you motor disease, it's now also appreciated that you have striated defects, frontotemporal dementia, people have very, very strange behavior where all of a sudden uh, they start to insult their beloved. So here, loss of nuclear function, gain of cytoplasmic aggregates. We model that in the fly, and again here we are in the ring, so we can use those tools also to address certain aspects. And the point here to make is, this is the loss of function, this is the gain of function. When you look at those deficits, the first thing we see is that you have transsynaptic deficits. It starts at the presynapse and subsequently leads to the loss of those neurons here. <coughs> which is what you see also in patients. And what we think here is that this protein, when it becomes depleted of the nucleus, starts to accumulate in the cytoplasm actually over time leads to the loss of neurons, which is a dying back in our degeneration. So, this is where things are going at the moment. These are the people that were involved in my lab, Ray Dolan, Keito. These are the people from Hammerhead VR. This is really enjoyable because it's, it's coming from a completely different angle. And Nick Strassel, of course, with whom everything started over a glass of wine, and other collaborators. And thank you for your attention. fantastic insight into neural mechanisms and we have plenty of time for discussion. I would like to open the discussion. So yes, please. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, the, uh, your, your theory hinges quite heavily on the existence of modules in the other side of the body and you said there is a, <coughs> uh, a sensory organization to that. Uh, what is the basis for there being modules and is there some other kind of organization that would define what the modules are? Uh, it might be easier. So the question was, what is the argumentation that there are modules in the ellipsoid body? And whether there is some other organization? Well, what might be the basis of the organization? Because you said it wasn't uh, organized uh, around vision. Well, the argumentation is that those studies here all inactivated specific ring neuron layers, okay? And 
it's not only vision. So you, you know, this is visual place learning, but also uh, very specific experiments from Roy Richman, where he uh, triggered the ellipsoid body, then led to uh, motor output. And the modular organization is based on the fact how it's wired up, right? Definite proof of a modular organization, I would say, is not in, in there, but it's a concept. Does it answer your question? So that, uh, that defined anatomically? Here? Yeah. Uh, so the, the colors are the reference modules, yeah? Yes, exactly. And these are anatomically defined? So yes. And, and you know how many there are? Of the modules? Yeah. We have, uh, in flies, we have eight, uh, 16, Jerry Rubin argues 18. Uh, it depends on the animal, you can have more or less. And that's a very good point, actually. Um, depending on the dexterity of the animal, you have more. And the, the less dexterity they show, the less you have. So yeah. the, the, it's a relatively small number, so yes. just that the hypothesis is that, that these are, so you're, the modules are within the ellipsoid body uh, forming uh, columns that compete with each other. Mm -hmm. And so you have essentially a competition between up to 20 different uh, action patterns, perhaps. Right? That's the minimum, I would say. <laughs> yes. Or would you think? You okay, perhaps we should action. give. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Curses, uh, you can <laughs> come back later. <laughs> Marvel options. Okay. <laughs> You're really more targeted, like, and, and, and all the evidence seems to show that the ellipsoid body only mean activation sentence, like they all have to do with the animal steering, moving in a direction. So that there seems to be a much clearer mapping from this pattern to directed movement by the animal. And I know it's not linked to your rectum cortex or, or necessarily to a particular place, but nevertheless it's to do with turning left or turning right or going in a certain direction much. And I don't know of any evidence that makes it clear that they're different types of action, so it's different directions of action are different types of action. It may boil down to translational and rotational movements. Um, yes. So, there's something strange about this ellipsoid body. Well, there are many things strange about it, but one thing that stands out in this comparison to basal ganglia and basal ganglia type processing, that is that it can sustain a specific pattern of activity over an extended period of time. So, so what's the mammalian equivalent for that uh, dynamical feature with respect to basal ganglia cortical circuitry? I have no idea. Okay, but don't you, do you see that as a, as a, as a critical difference? Or do you, would you say we have not measured enough from the male and basal ganglia? Because we have measured a lot from the male and basal ganglia, but if a sustain would exist, it should be observed by now, no? There, there are neurons in strife that are uh, active joint number and behavior. It was over 88 seconds? Yeah. As a population? It's a separate. Okay, so uh, about 40 years ago, it was shown in crustaceans that you could evoke very discrete behaviors by stimulating single axons. In insects, to my knowledge, the only time that was ever demonstrated was in stridulation and crickets by David Bentley. What do you think is the minimal unit of behavior and why in insects do you need populations as opposed to single ones? The behaviors you refer to, you can have in a fly without a head. Mm -hmm. So if we decapitate a fly, it, it has, it has it has composition, mm -hmm. uh, and you can poke it, and it walks. Mm -hmm. But they, they, it's not properly coordinated. They, the goal direction is taken out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I would ask back then, what is behavior in your case? So is behavior then just doing this? I can do that without a head. Mm -hmm. I can see that. No, I agree. Yeah. yeah. So I think this becomes of significant importance when it's when you talk about goal directed behavior and decision making. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Perhaps may, I may ask this maybe a stupid question. It intrigues me all the time. Is sleeping an active decision? Ah. So and again this is not hand waving. We are do, we are not doing well. 
we see some sleep here from the inactivated neurons. My answer to that is yes, it's an extremely active state. You have to actively suppress motor activity, and this is again illustrated with disease cases such as the restless leg syndromes, because the, there is a dopamine component in that, but it also uh, in, in uh, the, the sleepwalkers. Right? Oh. Sleepwalkers are not conscious, but they do weird things. Right? Oh. And it's coordinated movements. They're not just you know, doing this. They, I mean, they try to go into the cupboard and have a wee there instead of going to the toilet, right? But they're not aware of it. But some pretend only to be sleepwalkers if you go to the fridge and eat. Yes. <laughs> okay, no, thank you very much because I, I think it's really, I, I, th I thought about this when you said that the Parkinson disease people have problems with sleeping. Yes. And this seems to be a point also to this fact that it's an active <coughs> thing to do. Okay. Okay, you, you've done a great job of convincing us that the basal ganglia and the central complex are very strongly related. Paul already got one question uh, about what the, what the differences are that you've found so far. So the question is, my question is, are there significant differences <coughs> uh, that, or are there just still some questions? <laughs> there are a lot of questions. Uh, I mean, this is a very humble <coughs> concept, I would say, which we put forward to, you know, how can I say, uh, the hypothesis stands until it's shut down. I think the strongest, uh, uh, the, the most pronounced weakness at the moment, I, I discussed it with Paul, but not, not you put it, so is, you know, we're talking about loops, we're talking about uh, certain physiological properties, which we have no idea at the, in the fly brain at the moment. You know, I showed you some, some images about electrophysiology. Uh, in Drosophila, this is very, very tedious because the cells are very small. Roy Ritzman is doing a fantastic job in, 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 in uh, praying mantis or in cockroaches. Uh, but to be honest with you, I'm also very skeptical. When we came up with this, Nick and I, we thought, hmm, this is a bit far-fetched, right? And one of the biggest problems I had was the globus pallidus has tonic inhibitory activity. And we could not, for God's sake, did not find it in the fly. Until uh, a few months ago, Mark Wu's lab, who showed that our two neurons are critical for sleep drop, have tonic activity, and we know they're inhibitory. So, but this is, you know, I might be completely biased, fishing for the, for, for the similarities. I mean, I'm fully aware that when you look at the fly brain and a, and a mammalian brain, there's so many differences. I think what this points to, and this is why I think this is of interest here, regardless of whether you think it's homology or convergence, we see here certain design principles, architectural principles, that, you know, apparently, I would say, if it comes to action selection, there seems to be a constraint to come to, well, it sounds like teleology, te like te teleology. <laughs> You seem to come to those solutions, right? I favor that this points towards a common ancestor, where such a solution was already in place, and then it was further elaborated. But that, of course, is debatable. So, my last question here. Yeah, um, so, I uh, thought your model was very interesting. There seemed to be a lot of order, uh, especially from the ellipsoid body down to the lateral accessory lobes. Um, but I'm wondering what kind of order exists in the connections that then leave the lateral accessory lobes? Is it just kind of a mess? Does it get really reduced down? Um, um, I'm really grateful that you <laughs> put, that you bring this question up because this is okay. So, so where is it? Excuse me. Here. So. The lateral accessory lobe, Barbara, correct me if I'm wrong, <coughs> there is hardly anything published about it. There are two papers that you can rely on. So it's, uh, I can show you those, and it's a black box. There are not many tools available to specifically target the lateral accessory lobe. We have hardly any recordings from the lateral accessory lobe. And if you consider, 
and this is a focal statement I know, that the lateral accessory locus of thalamus in flight, this is wild west. So whoever wants to join. <laughs> yeah, we hardly know anything. Yes. Uh, Sting Rollers published a review where he argues the pallium has a major role here. Where, where does that fit in? The pallium? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is. This is work from Stan Grillner, who works on lamprey, which, uh, from evolutionary considerations, is at the base of vertebrates. Uh, so it would be here in insects. Uh, and of course, we know, for example, the mushroom bodies play a critical role also in action initiation and maintenance. So don't get me wrong that the simple complex does everything. There is a clear communication between the mushroom bodies. And of course that makes sense when you have goal-directed decision-making, you want to you check with previous experience. You know, is this good, is this bad? Mm -hmm. And there are good arguments from Scott Weddell's lab, for example, that there is error prediction uh, coding taking place. Mm -hmm. So that you can, whatever you do, it is checked against previous experience. Paul? But you, but you just, just my understanding, if you go back to your model, um, you, you loop everything over the thalamus, and then um, your, but your motor output is supposedly triggered by your thalamus, also for the mammalian or the vertebrate case, which that's is odd, a, isn't it? That's an oversimplification. We know, for example, escape behavior completely ignores the simple complex. There are connections going straight into right. uh, the giant power system. Right. This is but sort of for the vertebrate case. But in the vertebrate case, the, the output from the basal ganglia to the midbrain goes directly to the motor structures, and the output to the cortex goes back, goes back by the thalamus. No, the cortex projects over the pyramidal tract straight down into your spinal cord, throwing yeah. off well, this the collaterals that's into your midbrain and brain. For the, for right. the mama, but for the vertebrate, uh, the, so the structural like pericolicus projects into the striatum by the thalamus. No, wait, that's the output from the, the basic angle. Right, no, wait, right, I, I don't understand. Look, Frank, it's great you brought your lawyer, by the way. <laughs> but the point is that um, the, the outputs of this system are not going by the thalamus. The outputs of, of the, the basal ganglia cortical motor control systems bypass the thalamus to, is the recurrent projection back into these structures, into the cortex, which you would need your thalamus. So, my, my question to Frank is basically, well, if that's a simplification for the, for the vertebrate case, what so does that like, mean for your invertebrate case? Because maybe, this, so because since you have more degrees of freedom still in the in invertebrate case, because a lot of science still needs to be done there, right, maybe you're excessively constraining yourself now with respect to these motor outputs. I agree. I agree. Yes. But he has a point. When it comes to that, this is, I mean, Sam Brown will mostly show that. Yeah. So last but one question. Okay, two more questions, and then I think we have to stop to go to this discussion. Yes. Uh, what about cerebellum? Was it that these are the first or the third one? I could put up another talk now for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> you go on. <laughs> I, I just presented it in Geneva a few weeks ago. Uh, this is a crazy story, and just just believe me, but it's not published. It's not even submitted. It's close to submission. Uh, we found evidence there is a cerebellum in insects, uh, that's by genetic means and etc. etc. To me, I could not believe it for, this is a project which runs for 12 years, I could not believe it myself, but to give you, what, what, what knocked me off my shoes was when Harvey Carton over in Manhattan uh, asked me, so Frank, why do you think this, there is a cerebellum? Did you check for uh, Purkinje cell proteins? Did you check for a zinc finger and cerebellum proteins? So I went back, looked up the gene sequences, blasted it against the Drosophila genome, and those homologs are expressed exactly in that region, which is the antennal and counter-sensory motor center. I have a whole story for that. <laughs> But this is for another. So the first, first, you have to wait, first, you have to wait for the science or nature publication. In <laughs> it goes so far that you, we, thanks to the Genelia collection of Galfoland, we were able to identify a population of neurons that 
fulfill almost all criteria of Fukuji cells. It's really crazy. They are flask like, they have a very polarized dendritic tree. But again, you know, you may say, well, yeah, he's talking. Okay, so last question. Uh, I want to refer to the uh, hyperreality test. I think I have a feeling that we all fail because the test and the question was set up for us to fail. Because probably uh, if you go to the slide, you can move to the Actually, you did that. Most of you said in the middle. Yes. And I thought this was a complete success. <laughs> this is interesting that you bring it up again. Where is it? Sorry. So the point is that you were manipulating us, right? <laughs> <laughs> the point yeah, is, is, which applies to um, body language, the intellectual or physical, and which applies to robotics. If the question was, who of these three guys we trust? Not for the universe is real or unreal. So you normally uh, read the eye contact. Yeah. And you don't know oh. the person who is facing you real and not with the, you don't give this sneaky look on the <laughs> <laughs> That's a very strong, totally okay. Yes. It's a biased experiment. You should change it. <laughs> Reject it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's a very good point. I think I think we're we have to thank Frank once more.